He was a Kentucky boy who wanted to fly. He enlisted in the Air Force during the Korean War, but the war ended before he saw action. Desperate to prove himself, he was ordered to a secret base in New Mexico to learn the art of nuclear warfare. Bored even with that, he considered leaving the Air Force when a mysterious stranger offered him the opportunity to try something new. He became a member of the elite squadron of U-2 pilots, working not for the Air Force, but for the CIA. He flew missions so secret he couldn't even tell his family, until in 1960, he was shot down over the Soviet Union. At that moment, he ceased being a pilot and became instead a pawn in a geopolitical chess game he barely understood. He is Francis Gary Powers, and he is a legend of air power. Francis Gary Powers was born on August 17, 1929, the only boy in a family of six children, the son of a coal miner. There are not too many lives harder than the life of a Depression-era coal miner. Work was intermittent and paid badly when it was available. Powers' father, Oliver, wanted his son to be a doctor. During World War II, coal miners worked overtime. For the first time, the Powers family had a little money. At a county fair, Oliver paid two and a half dollars to buy his 14-year-old son a short ride in a small plane. And after he flew in this biplane, uh, he came back down and he told uh, my grandparents, his parents, uh, that he'd left his heart up there. So that was his very first experience with flying, and from that moment on, he knew that he wanted to be a pilot. Desperate to contribute to the war effort, Powers planned to join the Navy after his high school graduation. The war ended, however, before he could enlist. He enrolled at his father's behest in tiny Milligan College in Tennessee. There, surrounded by veterans attending college on the GI Bill, he concluded that history had passed him by. During his senior year, he applied to the Air Force cadets. He took the test, passed, and had only to sign the papers upon his graduation. His father, however, had other plans and convinced Francis, despite the outbreak of war in Korea, to return home and await his draft notice. A short time there convinced Francis otherwise, and in October 1950, two months after turning 21, he enlisted in the Air Force in hopes that he would qualify as a pilot. He trained at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, learned photography at Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, and then was assigned as a photo technician. He applied again for the Air Cadets. Finally accepted in November 1951, he reported for flight school. He learned to fly in a T-6, a heavy, obsolete 1930s fighter that served longer and more honorably as a trainer. He hustled through training and soloed after only 20 hours in the air. He wrote years later how wonderful it had felt being alone in the air, totally responsible for his actions. After six months, he went on to advanced flight training. He checked out on jets and earned a reputation as a totally unflappable pilot, calm, confident, and self-contained, who wanted nothing more than to serve his country in combat. He graduated from the cadets in 1952. His last stop before Korea was gunnery school. There, he came down with appendicitis. The delay cost him dearly. Washed back to the next class, the war ended before he graduated. For the second time, history had passed him by. In October 1953, he went to New Mexico to learn how to drop nuclear weapons from fighter aircraft. He was given, in effect, his own piece of the American battle plan. A base to report to, a plane to fly, a route into the Soviet airspace, and a target to hit. In 1954, he made first lieutenant, 
and married Barbara Gay Moore, an 18-year-old he'd met the year before. He had decided to serve out his enlistment and become an airline pilot. As his separation date approached, he contacted several airlines and discovered that he was too old to be considered for airline training. So, with a wife to support and no other options, he re-enlisted. Little did Powers know that in the Nevada desert, in a restricted area that would come to be known as Area 51, the United States government was testing a new kind of airplane, a spy plane capable of flying higher than the anti-aircraft weapons of its time could reach. The U-2, as the secret craft was known, was designed and built for a very specific mission, to fly over the Soviet Union east of the Ural Mountains, an area the size of Canada that was sealed off to Western eyes. There, the Soviet Union had built whole cities dedicated to the development of new weapon systems, cities that the West had no way to peer into. The idea of flying over the area was not new. The United States had modified strategic bombers to serve as spy planes. They had the range but could not fly high enough to avoid Soviet radar and guns. But the U-2 would be different. It would fly with impunity above the range of even the most advanced Russian radar. It could overfly and photograph the most secret Soviet installations and return safely to base. Intelligence gathering with the U-2 would become business-like, regular, commonplace. President Eisenhower approved the project almost without hesitation. He believed that knowing what the Russians were doing in their blacked-out hinterlands held the key to protecting America from the nuclear war people like Francis Powers were preparing to fight. In late 1955, Francis Gary Powers returned from a training mission and saw his name written on a blackboard in the pilot ready room. He reported to wing headquarters, where a major asked him if he was interested in a civilian job. Powers asked for details, which the major refused to provide. Instead, he told Powers to go to an off-base motel for a meeting. He was recruited for the CIA U-2 program. Uh, he volunteered for uh, uh, several reasons. Uh, one, it was doing something patriotic for his country. Uh, one, it was flying a new type of airplane that no one had ever flown before, so there was the thrill of adventure. And uh, three, it was a, uh, a wonderful pay increase. After several conversations with the CIA agent, in April, Powers resigned his commission in the Air Force and became officially a civilian. While pilots in the Air Force were taking home barely $400 a month, Powers and the other U-2 pilots started at $1,500 during training and went up to $2,000 when they deployed overseas. The small core of U-2 pilots assembled at Lockheed's facility in Burbank, California. From there, they flew by transport to a secret Air Force base in the Nevada desert called Watertown. There was, of course, no water in Watertown. A seemingly limitless expanse of desert, Watertown's key attributes were its privacy and lack of distractions. Like participants in the Manhattan Project, who were isolated in the New Mexico desert for years while they chipped away at the secrets of the atom, upon their arrival in Watertown, the U-2 pilots became a cloistered society of airborne spies. They stepped off the plane. There was this long-winged, droopy-looking airplane, kind of looked like a mosquito with droopy wings. Uh, some of the pilots wanted to get back on the transport and go back home. <laughs> they didn't know what they had signed up for. The U-2's wings were nearly twice as long as the fuselage. Their tips kept off the tarmac by temporary wheels designed to drop off as the plane left the ground. Compared to the other aircraft of the 1950s, the U-2 seemed almost wispy. No matter what the engineers said, the Air Force believed the plane to be almost disposable, so frail that it would have to be discarded after only a few missions. Years later, Powers wrote, Each piece of the structure was a little thinner than a pilot would have liked. It was not a plane for heavy or drastic maneuvers. 
My hands itched to get onto the controls. The U-2 was a very different kind of aircraft. It required only a thousand feet of runway to take off and then climbed at a more than 45 degree angle. In the time it took a normal aircraft to climb a few thousand feet, the U-2 could disappear into the stratosphere. The U-2 pilots regularly broke altitude records, flying more than 15 miles high, but the records were never reported. Instead, the pilots cheered their successes silently, enjoying an almost orbital view of the world. Their training was exhaustive, but failed to deal with one critical aspect of their mission. What if the plane crashed in enemy territory? Powers, in his autobiography, says he raised the topic with his commanding officer. He was told simply that if captured, he should tell the Russians everything they asked, since they were experienced at torture and would get the information eventually anyway. To a veteran of nuclear training, that sounded like conduct unbecoming an officer. He felt it was a glib dismissal of his real concerns, a dismissal based on CIA conceit that the U-2s flew too high for the Russians to shoot down. Even the manual self-destruct system, which had to be triggered by the pilot, seemed incomplete. It packed only a small charge, enough to destroy the cameras lodged in the plane's belly but not the plane itself. The first batch of U-2s and pilots deployed to a base in England in April 1956, undercover as the first weather reconnaissance squadron. In August, Powers moved to Insulik Air Force Base, Turkey, as part of the second weather reconnaissance squadron. The first U-2 flights out of Turkey skirted the edges of Soviet airspace. Just as modern intelligence-gathering planes fly along the coast of China, the U-2s flew along the southern edge of the Soviet Empire. From high above the clouds, they eavesdropped on Soviet radio transmissions, plotting the locations of radar and anti-aircraft installations. In November, Powers made the first tentative probe of Soviet airspace. The flight went off without a hitch and nothing he or the instruments in his plane detected showed any signs the Soviets knew he was there. It didn't take too many flights for complacency to set in. In the late 1950s, while the U-2s were flying countless spy missions over the Soviet Union, relations between the Russians and the United States began to improve. Nikita Khrushchev, who succeeded Joseph Stalin as the Soviet premier, changed the Russian strategy of unremitting hostility to the U.S. The Soviet economy was faltering, the inevitable effect of Stalin's purges and various five-year economic plans. Khrushchev believed that trade with the West and adoption of American industrial techniques might help solve Russia's economic woes. In September 1959, Khrushchev visited the United States. He was not dour or menacing. He seemed almost clownish, a jovial, rotund emissary from the other side of the world. He proposed a massive disarmament, keeping nuclear weapons while mothballing conventional navies and air forces. In the communist world, Khrushchev's sudden fascination with the West did not play well. The Soviet military protested what they perceived as Khrushchev's slight, and the Chinese communists, vying for leadership of the many Marxist movements around the world, condemned Khrushchev as counter-revolutionary. Publicly committed to a May 1960 summit in Paris, Khrushchev seemed trapped. The West saw the summit as the most important diplomatic event since the end of World War II. The communist world saw it as more Khrushchev backsliding. The Soviet premier needed a way to back out and still save face. As the climate between East and West warmed, the number of U-2 flights decreased. Months passed without a single flight out of Insulik Air Base, where Francis Gary Powers was stationed. And then in April 1960, Apparently, to provide information and in preparation for the summit meeting, two missions were scheduled back-to-back. -back. The first flight was normal, 
the pilot departing and returning to base without incident. The second, which Powers was scheduled to fly, was the most ambitious U-2 flight ever. Covering almost 4,000 miles, the nine-hour flight would pass over areas so deep in the Soviet Union, even the U-2 had not overflown them, and would end at a base in Norway. Powers packed a bag, assured his wife he'd be home in a few days, and got on a transport to Pakistan, where a U-2 was waiting for him. Delayed several days by bad weather, Powers finally took off at 6.26 a.m. May 1st. As he climbed into the sky, he clicked his radio call button twice, the signal that he was well and ready to begin his mission. That was the last anyone heard of Francis Gary Powers and his U-2 for a while. My uncle uh, told me a story about how uh, the uh, uh, two or three gentlemen in suits came down to the family farm, knocked on the door. Uh, my grandmother answered, and uh, she was informed that uh, Francis, as the family called him, was missing. Uh, the family uh, it was devastated. Uh, for the first five days, they didn't know whether my father was alive or dead. In Turkey, the public information officer announced that an unarmed weather plane operated by NASA had disappeared. Privately, the CIA was sure Powers was dead. Powers was, however, alive. Shot down over Svedlovsk, he became Khrushchev's secret weapon, his excuse to back out of the Paris summit and a tool to embarrass the American president on the world stage. On May 5th, the premier told the Supreme Soviet that an American aircraft had invaded Soviet territory and had, on his personal order, been shot down. On May 6th, the State Department spokesman stated categorically that there was no deliberate attempt to violate Soviet airspace and called Khrushchev's accusation monstrous. On May 7th, Khrushchev sprang his trap, pulling out of the summit and announcing to the world that he had the pilot alive. Suddenly, it was Eisenhower who was trapped. On May 11th, he admitted that the United States government had been lying and that he had authorized the flights. He called aerial spying a distasteful necessity of the Cold War. He had, in effect, signed Powers Confession. My father was interrogated for 90 days uh, from about May 7th up through uh, August uh, 15th, which was the day of his trial. He was interrogated uh, approximately 16 hours per day uh, for 90 days a bright spotlight, a good KGB agent, a bad, bad KGB agent. They'd drill him with questions. They'd try to trip him up with... Uh, the very first uh, week, he was lying outright to them, uh, misleading them in any direction he could. But then on about day seven of the interrogations, one of the KGB officers comes in uh, side with a, a copy of the New York Times, and he yells at my father and says, you've lied to us. You told us that you were trained in Arizona. The New York Times says that you were trained in uh, Nevada at Area 51. You might as well tell us everything, or else we'll get it out of your American press anyways. Powers' trial began on his 31st birthday. He walked into the courtroom through a gauntlet of flashbulbs and news cameras. His three-day show trial had little to do with his flight and much to do with Soviet-American relations. I realized, he said later, that the trial would not be USSR versus Francis Gary Powers, but the USSR versus the US, and, incidentally, Francis Gary Powers. The guilty verdict, prepared before the trial by Soviet authorities, concluded that his flight had been ordered to torpedo the Paris summit and to prevent the easing of international tension. His sentence? 10 years in prison. With powers locked away, wild rumors swirled. A London paper published an article claiming he would be released from prison and had decided to live in the Soviet Union. Self-styled military experts surmised that he had been flying too low, and others criticized him for not killing himself. For more than a year and a half, powers languished. In February 1962, the Russians suddenly transported him to East Germany. In a safe house in East Berlin, 
The KGB informed him that if all went well, he would be released the next day. On February 10th, at the Gleinecke Bridge separating East and West Berlin, Powers walked to freedom in exchange for Colonel Rudolf Abel, a Soviet spy. Powers came back to a country that had its doubts about his conduct. Though he had apparently given away no secrets, rumor and speculation remained. Hero or bum, asked one headline. Should he, like Nathan Hale, have died for his country? And he was always uh, uh, upset that the American government didn't do more to help clear his name at the time. Upon his return to the United States, he was interrogated by the CIA as if he were an enemy. He took and passed polygraph tests to make sure he was not a double agent. And the final report on his ordeal damned him with the faint praise that he had only probably withheld national security information from the Soviets. Concerned about the speculation, President Kennedy canceled a White House ceremony to welcome Powers home. When Powers wrote a book telling his side of the story, the CIA suppressed its publication. Francis Gary Powers died in August 1977. After the end of the Cold War, the only war Powers ever fought in, declassified Soviet documents made clear that his behavior in captivity was nothing less than heroic. On May 1st, 2000, the 40th anniversary of his final flight over the Soviet Union. He was awarded the Prisoner of War Medal, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and the CIA Medal of Valor. The boy from Kentucky who had wanted to fly and to be a hero finally was. And that is why he is a legend of air power.